So I've been involved in the internet technical community since the early 90s. So primarily uh, in my academic role as a faculty at Columbia and previously as a researcher at Bell Labs and, uh, and a German research lab here in Berlin actually. And secondly, uh, and then as more recently as a staff member of the Federal Communication Commission. And so in that role, I've been participating in kind of traditional academic research, primarily in the networking realm, but also working within primarily the Internet Engineering Task Force on standards development for Internet applications, primarily real-time applications. The topics that I've worked on probably the most are, uh, as I said, the real-time internet applications, uh, voice over IP and real-time streaming applications. So voice over IP, delivery of phone calls over the internet. Uh, and that led to a number of protocol developments that are now fairly commonly used in the industry. So this is uh, the real-time transport protocol that transports uh, audio and video uh, content across networks. And that's often used for uh, audio and video um, telephony within enterprises, but also increasingly on the wide area. So there's a number of voice over IP providers, as well as what are known as 4G or voice over LTE uh, systems that use that type of technology. And then uh, a corresponding protocol that is used to control the, uh, the session, the session initiation protocol, SIP, that's commonly used, again, in the enterprise space. Uh, many of your new IP PBXs that are used as kind of your desktop phones in offices, they typically use that, as well as, again, uh, mobile uh, phone carriers as part of the uh, Internet Multimedia Subsystem, IMS, uh, in that. I've also worked on a number of applications in public safety. Uh, and how do you support uh, emergency calls such as 112 and 911 uh, in a new all IP environment? It's really hard to answer that in generalities because the internet has become such a diverse. Uh, ecosystem, and it's probably much more productive to think of this as not like a single entity, but again, like an ecosystem where parts of the ecosystems are quite healthy and others not so much. So let me try to just go give you a few examples of that, because we're now seeing really that when we talk about the internet, we're really talking about two somewhat separate things, the technology and the global infrastructure. The technology, namely the protocols and other software artifacts and so on that are, uh, use internet protocols but may not actually be used on the internet. They may be used in private networks and data centers and enterprises and homes without necessarily touching the internet. I think that development has been robust and continues to progress pretty rapidly where the major problems are probably in terms of robustness and reliability on uh, security related problems as well uh, but the technology seems to be able to keep pace with demand the other one is the internet as a network that you connect to, exchange data on, communicate with other people on and that again I, I think that in many countries and many regions, uh, things are moving ahead quite nicely. Uh, speeds are improving, uh, the availability on mobile devices is dramatically increasing, but we also have simultaneous challenges. Uh, we, just to name a few, uh, again, the security challenges that uh, increasingly make it difficult, particularly for individuals and small businesses, to know what information is truly secure and private, uh, what of their bank account or their private data, medical data is at risk, and also at a larger scale for enterprises uh, being exposed to the theft of their uh, intellectual property, and I'm not talking about music here and videos primarily, I'm talking here about uh, blueprints and chemical formulas and customer lists and all the other things that companies uh, maintain private uh, in order to ha maintain their competitive position. That, I think, is a major challenge simply because it doesn't seem possible 
for ordinary individuals to, uh, to keep up with the deficiencies in both protocol design and implementation uh, to have a reasonable certainty that uh, the tools they use won't be used against them. Uh, there's also other more larger scale challenges, namely uh, the suppression of internet freedoms in a number of countries, uh, issues of privacy, uh, how do we balance free access to information and services on mobile devices with my uh, desire to maintain private uh, information as private. Let me talk about uh, security as one. Uh, First of all, I think it's important that I don't want you to just fall into the trap to say the internet is insecure because that's not really a helpful statement. Uh, it doesn't differentiate enough between the various components because uh, I would I look at that at three pieces, namely one piece is the underlying technology, the second piece is the implementation software primarily and hardware to some limited extent, and thirdly the operational practices. And there are problems in all areas, but they're very different problems. I think there is generally has been for at least a decade a fairly profound awareness on the design and engineering side that A, you need to design protocols for hostile environment, and we have reasonable ideas on how to do that. Uh, and I would say that at least most protocols that have been designed we, somewhat recently or have been enhanced recently all have good to acceptable security mechanisms built in. So it is not so much a problem that internet protocols are insecure, though there's some uh, that certainly could use strengthening, particularly in the routing side, and again on the access side, more in the, the land protocols. But the other areas are far less um, encouraging, namely in the implementation side, we seem to have difficulty on two counts, I mean, A, routinely we're designing reliable systems, software engineering, uh, often because it is not immediately obvious when something is insecure, it works just fine, uh, until somebody attacks it. And secondly, on how to test it and how to incentivize or de-incentivize people from building uh, secure and secure systems. Uh, currently, there seems to be a problem that many software developers, particularly smaller ones, but certainly not limited to those, seem to have difficulty, I don't know if it's an engineering problem or a management problem, to put enough resources into creating secure systems. Uh, designing by good engineering practices, testing, and in particular, uh, relying not just on internal testing, but also on external testing. We are used to in other areas where safety and security are at stake. You might think of vehicles or electric toasters. We have certifying bodies because we don't want to rely on the manufacturer themselves, as diligent as they may be, to completely trust them that they will know whether they did a good job. So we have um, entities like the Underwriters Laboratory for electrical uh, equipment, the TUV in Germany and other countries for safety, on just about anything, whether it's elevators or cars or umbrellas that have any type of even remote security or safety implication. We don't do that for software. And it is fairly obvious that that isn't really working. Just to give you one example that I've uh, encountered in my work, in my current line of work, uh, in the United States, we have a system called the Emergency Alert System, EAS, which is used to alert TV viewers on, on imminent threats to life or property. So think storms or uh, flash floods, tsunamis, all of those. So every TV station and cable system uh, is obligated to have a device that allows a public safety authority to submit a request to send out a broadcast saying to take cover, to take appropriate action. So it's obviously very important that this is a reliable system. Until maybe five years ago, these systems were not connected to the internet at all. They just, uh, there were some master stations that would broadcast it and then they would uh, retransmit it down the line. More recently, for convenience and operational purposes, they have designed systems that use internet-connected devices. Um, 
recently, in the past five years, uh, these TV stations have, for convenience and operational efficiency sake, installed boxes that connect on one side to the internet and on the other side uh, intercept the TV signal so that they can inject a crawler on the bottom of the screen and audio uh, into, that, into their TV signal because emergencies could happen anytime, even when there is no engineer on staff, for example. Well, unfortunately, these are fairly specialty devices, and whoever designed those didn't do a whole lot of testing. They violated just about every guideline known for uh, designing secure systems. So uh, what happened was somebody discovered these were, you could search for those, you could Google them on the internet. You just searched for the logging string. And then they used a default password, which you could also easily Google just by looking at the manual. And they then injected in about a dozen TV stations, primarily smaller TV stations, uh, a fake emergency alert about zombies emanating from the ground and that uh, the population should take cover uh, in that. Obviously kind of funny the first time around, but could easily be misused. So in our case, this happened just before the State of the Union address of the President of the United States, so there was grave concern that somebody would use that to sow panic like report a false terrorist attack, uh, that would occur. And so that was an example where somebody had designed a system not thinking that these would be connected to the internet, that people would not change the default password, and that there would be no other security protections in place. And there's many of these smaller systems. These could be home routers, it could be electric meters, that could be car systems, where there doesn't seem to be a true appreciation as to the dangers that could uh, occur if somebody gets access to those. And we don't seem to have a good way of dealing with that. The third aspect, I'll briefly talk about the operational aspect um, as the third consideration is, it used to be that many computing systems, or most of them, probably were operated by trained system administrators that at least had some professional awareness. The skill level probably varied, but at least many that worked in that field had uh, education in computer science or uh, maybe even some security training. But nowadays, many, if not most, computers are operated by individuals that have no technical training whatsoever, and they shouldn't have. We, and this is true for home networks, it's true for small business networks, I mean, your dentist, your baker type of thing, everybody has a computer uh, generally connected to the internet. I think your doctor's office probably has one for electronic medical records, and none of those are operated by trained system administrators. So it is very easy for um, these amateurs to make mistakes in operating uh, those type of systems. Again, We've designed systems not really well anticipating the kind of users that would really use them, thinking that they would, or maybe not even thinking, that they would be used in the same way that they were in the 1980s and 1990s. That doesn't mean we should train everybody to be a system administrator, that just doesn't work. We need to design systems that are secure, out of the box, you just can't make them insecure without a lot of effort. And we haven't really succeeded in that. It's been far too difficult. The type of technologies that people use, like passwords and so on, are becoming increasingly user unfriendly um, and they become increasingly unmanageable. And that's what I see as one of the challenges uh, to make it easy to secure, both build secure systems and to operate secure systems. One particular one is that the barrier to entry to creating new businesses, new content, has dropped dramatically. In the last decade or so, it is now possible for a much wider variety of individuals to not just consume content. You could always do that, radio, TV, and all that have existed for a century, but uh, you had a now we have possibility that ordinary individuals without a large budget or maybe even large deep technical skill sets could create very interesting content uh, of all kinds. So just examples, the Khan Academy for training materials, uh, individual small uh, local groups that could distribute videos, uh, websites and web applications that could be built, apps on smartphones. All of those are now accessible to many more individuals than 
than they were even a relatively short while ago. And that, I think, has probably been the greatest enabling capacity of the Internet, not so much just as a distributor of um, high-cost, uh, highly produced content. That's always been available, but as a means for distributing low-cost, uh, low-effort, and much more democratic, if you like, uh, content both for cultural, as well as just plain business uses, as well as educational. One of the things, and we've uh, been involved in that in the Federal Communication Commission, is to ensure an open internet. Namely, uh, almost by physical design, not everybody, while everybody can, or most everybody can create content and application, it is very difficult for most people to operate their own network. You just can't string your own fiber or run your own cell towers. And so the number of operators in almost every country in a particular region is, tends to be very small, a handful, even if you count wireless operators. Typically, you have your copper-based provider, your fiber or, or coax-based provider, and then maybe a, a small number, three or four uh, wireless operators, cellular operators. Because of the cost, billions of dollars to build a network, we can't really rely purely on competition to ensure that users have access to uh, the legal content that they want to get access to, create content that they want to create, because in some cases, both the content that they want to access and the content that they want to create may well compete with uh, other business ventures that the network provider has. Most of the network providers, at least in the US, for example, also distribute their own video content. Uh, they may have applications of their own. Uh, they certainly have had voice applications, for example, uh, and that's very common for almost every network operator. And so they have incentives to give themselves uh, an advantage in order to compete uh, with other um, providers of content and application. So I believe it continues to be important to have rules and mechanisms in place so that providers cannot discriminate against uh, providers of applications and content. So because in many cases that is essentially our primary means of accessing information of all kinds uh, in that. That it remains a long-term challenge. How to do that in ways that doesn't unduly interfere with expansion of a network, doesn't unduly increase cost. So in, in the US, we have found uh, as one current mechanism the um, FCC Open Internet Order, which spells out some of the conditions kind of at high level, how that should work out. Um, but other regions and countries, such as Europe, are still um, trying to find their way to find that balance. One of the other uh, challenges that I see is as the network has become, in both good ways and bad ways, a commodity, namely we all rely on it. It's something that we notice mainly when it's not around, as in, I can't get internet access. What's going on here? Uh, we expect it in every hotel, in every airport, certainly in most homes, schools, uh, wherever. Uh, one of the things that is, I think, in some danger is a robust research infrastructure. Uh, you, if you look at many of the major providers of hardware and software and services, used to all have significant sized research labs. Just to give you one example that I heard recently, uh, Nokia obviously primarily both, they would both do network infrastructure and handsets, used to have 600 researchers in their lab. They're now down to 60. Uh, Verizon, uh, in its previous incarnations, used to have very large research labs in multiple uh, facilities now that did not just short-term but long-term research through their Bell Atlantic and other research lab uh, facilities. Talcordia, the same thing. They all used to have long-term research. They've largely discontinued that. There's only really a very relatively small number of companies that still do networking-related research that has more than just a six-month time horizon. Universities continue to do that as a vibrant research community, but it can't be universities by themselves, uh, particularly because for a variety of reasons, funding is no longer nearly as available as it used to be, uh, both funding through governments as well as uh, because of the downsizing of uh, corporate research activities, uh, funding available through uh, corporate um, sponsorship. 
if we don't have a vibrant research community, the problems that I alluded to earlier, security, accessibility, uh, the usage for content creation, will all suffer. We won't notice it because we won't notice it directly. We won't notice what we're missing since we don't see it. But we don't have that. I think it will be much harder to solve those problems because in many ways, those type of research efforts have often created artifacts that were widely distributed, uh, had low cost to acquire, which means lots of people could use those and adopt them. Uh, they tended to be non-proprietary. They tended to be an uh, emphasis on uh, making sure that it was available. And if you don't have that anymore, if you just have very small scale uh, venture capital style research going on, we're missing out on something. I think it's partially uh, the competitive pressures. Uh, namely, research, almost by its definition, doesn't just accrue benefits to whoever does it. It's really hard to keep research secret so that nobody else benefits. You can do that in some areas such as pharmaceuticals where the output is a single drug that is easily patented and you have a 20 year uh, protection horizon uh, on that and it's very difficult for somebody else to replicate exactly that uh, prescription drug. But if you look at networking or computer science research in general, is most of the ideas that you generate are they're hard to contain. They just distribute themselves, so to say, through students, through publications, and all the normal mechanisms, which is a good thing. We want that to happen. But it had, from a purely local economic optimization mechanism, it's easy to say, hey, somebody else should do the research. I just get the benefit. But if everybody does that, you don't get any research done anymore. Uh, and in the old days, we always had, and this was just like more an accident than anything else, uh, than any planning. Uh, we either had very strong government funding, which isn't concerned about those issues. They don't, they don't really care, except maybe on a national level, as to who benefits from research. I, which in itself is a problem and when you have now some people say, well, let the other countries, say in the US, let the other countries do the research and we'll just basically build the stuff. Um, and, or we just do shorter term development work. The other problem or the other uh, issue is that you have uh, in those environments, you don't really have the set of people who can continue to do that research because some other areas have become kind of the go-to areas, big data, uh, say graphics in some cases. So we don't have quite the same uh, student population uh, that we have available now. Yeah. Uh, it's partially also because there aren't as many research jobs out there uh, that people in industry would go to. I mean, people don't have, when they start a master's or PhD program, they want to have some assurance that they will find a job afterwards. And research was often, industrial research was often a very attractive uh, destination because people recognize that only a very small fraction could become faculty. Uh, so what else are you going to do? Uh, and industrial research offered an a opportunity for a creative outlet and so on. So that is, is kind of this feedback loop that's not working in a very, very well right now. And it's not clear how we can get out of this given that government funding for general for research both in Europe and the US isn't increasing, uh, to put it very politely. And we have a set of decrease which then uh, diminishes the supply of talented students who want to participate in that research.